All right, shall we get started? Okay. So the topic, the main topic for today is multi-class classification. Um, it's sets the stage nicely for even more advanced topics such as structure prediction, ranking problems. Uh, you can view them all as instances of multi-class classification, although the, the practical methods differ a bit. So multi-class setting. Input space is arbitrary, x. Our output space is now a discrete set of classes, 1 through k. Initially, we don't make any assumptions about any relations between the elements of the output space, 1 through k. Later, we may add some assumptions. So, so far, our only method for attacking these problems that we've talked about are trees, decision trees, classification trees. Those, in those cases, it was very easy to make things multi-class as opposed to just binary. Um, so, and with trees, by extension, we can do random forests. So, so far, those are our methods for multi-class. But, so today, we're going to talk about a linear method for multi-class that's kind of really designed from the ground up to be a multi-class method. All right. So, but first, let's talk about a kind of an easy way to get multi-class from a binary classification. It's called a... Uh, a reduction, where you take a problem of one sort and you manage to solve it using a solution to another, usually simpler problem you already have. So, suppose we have a binary classifier. How can we use that to solve multi-class? So this maybe you've seen, have you guys seen this before? One verse all, one verse rest. Yeah, it's a um, simple idea. So in this picture, we have three classes: plus, minus, and circle. And what we've done here is we've fit three different linear classifiers. Each one separates one class from the rest of them. So this W0 classifier, WO, separates the O's from the pluses and minuses. The minus classifier separates the minuses from the pluses and the O's, and so on. And then what would we do with these classifiers? Suppose we get a new point. Well, there are lots of ways to combine these classifiers. One would be to... I mean, hopefully, if you find a point in the space, only one of the classifiers says that one belongs to me. So if you're in this area, then the only classifier that says that's, that's part of my space is the minus one. So we predict minus. The problem comes when you're in this area. So now two classifiers want to claim you, minus and O, in that corner region. And there you have to find some way to resolve it. Uh, okay. That's the general idea. So let's write that down a little bit more mathematically. So we're going to take k binary classifiers, one for each class, each trained to separate one class from the rest. And let's denote the k classifiers by h1 through hk. And they can output either hard classifications or scores. And whatever they do, what we're going to predict in our final prediction is whichever classifier gives the largest score for x. All right, so denote the class by i. And we're going to look at the predictions of each of the i classifiers, one for each class. And whichever gives the highest score, that's the one that we will use as our prediction. If there's a tie, you can break ties arbitrarily. That would be a method. Any questions on this general setting? All right. All right, so we're going to see if this method is good. Um, but to get there, we're gonna, I want to refresh you guys on some intuition on how to understand linear classifiers. All right, so let's go back to binary classification case. Suppose we have RD, Euclidean input space. Our output space is negative 1 and 1. And our linear classifier score function is, today I'm using this notation a little bit, because that's what the book I referred you guys to uses. This is the inner product of w and x, or w transpose x, same, same, same thing. And this produces our score for the positive class in binary classification. Right. Remember this? So this is there's our score function, and in binary classification, greater than 0 is predicting 1, less than 0 is predicting negative 1. All right, good. And if we want to predict a hard classification, we could do this sign. All right. So geometrically speaking, 
what do we know about the relationship between x and w when we're predicting a plus 1 versus a minus 1? Say again. Uh, so let's see. x and w are vectors. So, but it's the right idea. Okay, their cosine similarity is positive. I like it. Let's, let's dig into that. <laughs> so I was thinking of buying an iPad with the pencil so I could sketch beautiful drawings for you. <laughs> but I didn't. All right. All right, so what do we have here? We have W representing our classifier. And here's a vector x, which is our input. All right. So what's the prediction for w and x? What's the score function? The inner product of w and x. So suppose that w is not 0. All right, that's, that's reasonable. And let's also suppose that x is greater than 0. The norm of x is greater than 0. So x is not 0. Then you'll remember this from some math class, that the inner product of w and x is Magnitude of w, magnitude of x times cosine of theta. Right? Great. So when is this thing greater than 0? Well, dub, magnitude of norm, norm of w and norm of x are both greater than 0. So this whole thing is greater than 0 if cosine of theta is greater than 0, which is what you are saying. So when is cosine of theta greater than 0 for what theta is? Negative 90 degrees to 90 degrees. All right, and what exactly is theta? Theta is this angle between x and w, between our two vectors. So if this angle is between negative 90 degrees and 90 degrees, then the, the score, the inner product will be positive. The score is positive. The prediction is a 1. So anywhere on this side of this line, what's this line? This line is the normal to w, right? w is normal to this line. This is the actual separating hyperplane represented by w, the separating line. So we have our negative 1 class to the left of the line and the positive 1 to the right. All right, good refresher. All right, now let's consider a three-class example. I also could have used chalk. <laughs> so I have three classes. I've drawn the points with little x's. And let's see what we can do with the one versus all classifier here. So first. Let's specify our base hypothesis space. That's the space, in this case, that we're going to do our one versus all classifiers with. So we'll, call, we'll use linear classifiers, w transpose x, like we said. But importantly, um, note that there's no bias term. And so this separating hyperplane will always what? go through the origin. Will always contain the origin, just like it did here. Right? OK. 0 is orthogonal to w always. So. OK. Good. So what would the separating hyperplane be between 1 and the rest? You could see pretty clearly it maybe look like this, right? There's our separating hyperplane between 1 and the rest. And let's put the other ones in. All right, so now I've drawn three boundaries. Let's, let's analyze the boundary for 2. What's going on here? So I've, we've tried to separate 2 from the rest. Um, so w2 is pointing down. So which side of this blue line is classifying positive for 2? Is classifying for 2? Below. Below the line, yes. Anything that's in the, within 90 degrees of the w2 vector is going to be predicting 2. So that's not great in this example, because it gets every 2 incorrect. On the other hand, it's getting all the not to is correct. How did it choose? Why did it choose to put the bottom half of this plane for the class two and not the other way around? Yeah, because there are more two, there are more examples that it's getting correct by saying the separate saying the class of two is below, because that means the class of not two is above, and it gets all these points in one and three correct. And it's not getting nearly as many points in two wrong. So that's how that separation occurs. Any questions on this? OK. 
All right, so let's, um, let's use this as an opportunity to, to understand what the, um, what areas of this space are assigned to each class, right? So let's, let's play our score game again. So we need the score for a given class. Let's say score for class i. We have this inner product between wi and x, fine. And again, norm wi, norm x, cosine theta. Or theta i is now the angle between x and this particular wi. All right. And we're going to predict the class that has the highest score. So let's make a slight simpl simplifying assumption. Note that the separating hyperplane doesn't change with the norm of w, right? So nothing will change if we assume that w's all have the same norm. Let's do that. And then w's all have the same norm. x is always the same. So the only thing differing among these scores is the cosine of the angle. All right. So which class will we assign x to in terms of angles? OK. So x is classified by whichever has the smallest cosine of theta. So we're going we're gonna to have three scores, one for each class. And if we write them out, the first two factors in all three scores are the same, because wi, we assumed all have the same norm. x is always the same. So we're just left with cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, cosine theta 3. So the score is greatest for wherever the cosine of theta i is largest. When is cosine of theta maximized? When? Cosine theta is maximized at theta equals 0, at no angle. So if the angle between x and w is 0, that's a sure thing. And we will classify it by whichever angle between x, basically whichever wi x is closest to in angle measure, all right? cosine distance or something. All right. So I've sketched that out. So here's w. Let's look at the separating boundary between w1 and w2. So it's a little bit off here, but anything that's closer in angle to w1 gets assigned to red, and anything closer in angle to w2 is assigned to blue. So you can use that to break the plane up into the different classes it's going to predict. Is that clear? So I've just drawn this kind of angle bisection between each of the uh, wis. Okay. So you could actually think of this as, a, as a, an instance of a, it's a decision function. It's outputting three levels. In this picture, it's outputting red, green, and blue. But we could code it up. It's outputting one, two, or three. The input space is the plane x. And this is an instance of the hypothesis space of our kind of, not our base hypothesis space, but our final multi-class hypothesis space. This is a, an instance of a prediction function from that space. All right. So this approach didn't seem to work very well for this example, right? It's completely getting too wrong. Any ideas on how we can fix this? OK, add a bias term. So what would that allow you to do? That would allow you, for instance, let me use the cursor here to draw a separation like here, right? Or here. How would, would a bias help you separate two out? I don't see that. What else can we do? Is there another? But that's a good direction. You're suggesting change the hypothesis space, the base hypothesis space. Can we do something in that direction? OK. Say again. Kernel. Something else? New features. Make a nonlinear hypothesis space. Yeah. Sure, that's a possibility. We can make score functions or base hypothesis space that could, for instance, carve out a circle around two, for instance. That would be a way to do it. Okay. We could do absolute value or something. Uh, yeah, that would be an approach. So the question is whether we have to do that. So let's talk about this hypothesis space that I was mentioning here. So we have this base, hy base hypothesis space of linear score functions. And what we finally produce is this arg max over the different score functions. We predict a, well, this is our, 
final hypothesis space. What is the action space for a friction function in this hypothesis space? Remember what action spaces are? Yes, 1 through k. An action space is, contains the set of things that you produce by your friction function. So yes, in this case, we're producing a number 1 through k, one of the k classes. Great. So this defines the hypothesis space that we are just dealing with. So here's the question. This method, 1 versus all, with this hypothesis space failed on the example I gave. Is this an issue with the hypothesis space, or is this an issue with the method? using one versus all, or both? That is our question. OK. So again? All right, so you're suggesting the hypothesis space is inherently not going to be sufficient for this setup. Not so sure. Not so sure. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I, I don't know if some way wrong. I mean, there's a error there that I mean, the, the biasity and error is irreducible with that hypothesis space. OK. I mean, so you're saying, why is, what's so bad about this? Well, I mean, just looking at it, it's pretty clear how you can separate two from one and three. It's not like there's noise. It's like, just visually, it seems very obvious that you know, two is this zone, and one is this zone, and three is this zone. So if I would say that we are underfitting here in some kind of very obvious sense that. Um, so you're saying, well, it's maybe the best it could have done with this hypothesis space. And that's the question. That's the question. OK. So what about this? No, not that. What about this? What's going on here? So I have three new Ws. None of them point down. They all point towards their respective classes. I've drawn these class boundaries. First of all, do we agree that I've drawn the class boundaries correctly? So between 1 and 2, I've looked at which the angle distance. And I've, everything in red is closer in angle to the red W than to the blue. And everything in green is closer to the green arrow than the blue arrow in angle. OK, so you agree with the boundaries, the decision areas that I've drawn. All right. And this gets perfect classification. Is it from the same hypothesis space? Some yes, some no? I claim yes, because we have three linear score functions. The score functions are all linear. They're all W transpose x. Um, and we're taking an arg max of the score functions. So yes, this is from the, hypothesis, the same hypothesis space. The difference is that this is not the result of a one versus all training. All right. So one versus all fails us in this example, but the hypothesis space is vindicated. It's, it still does the trick. So what we're going to talk about as we, as we go on today is how can we get something like this? We need something that does more than just reducing to binary class. Question? OK, so, all right, so I think the question is, if you were going to use this reduction to one versus all, are there smarter ways to do it, such as shifting the data, this, the flavor? Well, I'm, also, I'm also just thinking if, you're, if you set your data so that it, it, uh, it's all falls around uh, the margin, then that would be I don't know. My thought is that, I mean, this is a pretty, this might be a good example. That if you, if you restricted hypotheses that have to go through the origin, then shifting to the origin doesn't let you discriminate if the entire class is centered at the origin. 
that wouldn't work so well. I see. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. So for ease of interpreting pictures, we made all the w's the same length. What ha do w's don't have to be the same length. Um, what, do things change if we change the w's in this hypothesis space? My original argument was that when you, if you change the length of w's, nothing changes. What I really was saying is that if you change the length of w, the separating hyperplane does not change. Right? But that's separating hyperplane, this is a binary classification thing. Right? When we have, let's see, these are separating hyperplanes for binary class. In this scenario, we don't have separating hyperplanes. We have regions of different classes. So now, in this setting, does the norm of the, do the norm of the W's matter? OK, what happens if we make W1 longer? What happens to its region of class 1? Yeah, it expands. Right, that's right. OK. So our hypothesis space is even more general than I'm kind of suggesting here in that you can have W's of different length. So for instance, one of the hypotheses could be W equals 0. Right, so. OK. Yes, please. If the hyperplane is? OK, so in this setting, uh, we have three w's. And each gives rise to a score function. And the idea of the score function is that this, this, say this is w1. So we have an x. And then we take the inner product between w1 and x. And that gives you a number. And the bigger the number is, the more it's voting for class 1. All right? And same thing for 2 and same thing for 3. And now at any point in space, we can get the three scores given by inner product with w1, inner product with w2, and inner product with w3. Each of those give a score. And the red zone is the zone where all the x's have the highest score coming from w1. And blue is the highest scores from W2. And green is the highest score from W3. How to get, thank you. That's, well, that's the next section. That's a good question. Yeah. I've only, uh, am trying to justify the hypothesis space so far, but not telling you yet how to get it. But that's next. Exactly. When you make W longer, the score gets bigger. And so the region of red gets larger. That's right. And theoretically, it's like a, there's, there's no one hyperplane. It's like a well, yeah, these are, they're not rounded. They're angular. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yes? What, what? Are you saying my diagram is not accurate? <laughs> wait, wait, say it again. Where is the issue? Yes. W transpose x is maximized in the direction of that w vector, yes. Yes. The score decreases, correct? Down, OK. You mean like right here? You mean where I've drawn the hand? 
How do we resolve it, you're asking? Yeah, break ties arbitrarily. That is not in our hypothesis space. <laughs> is it? Uh, well, certainly not without bias. You can't, you're saying the three parallel lines would be like here and here? Yeah, that's not, that's not in our hypothesis space. We cannot do that. Does that answer your question? OK, yes. How did I know this region is red? Yeah. Oh, because in angle, it's closer to the red vector than the green vector. Do you agree? That's, it's from the argument earlier that the, you look at. So, so the points which are close to the negative y axis? These points, yes. Yeah, so basically, shouldn't it be like a triangle down there? You mean no classification? But just to the left of the y-axis, it really is close to the red vector. And to the right, it's closer to the green. So it, it's true that all the score functions are negative, but the red one still has the arg max by having the smallest magnitude of its negative value. Oh, thank you. I didn't realize that was the issue. <laughs> so is that answer the question? OK, so to reiterate for. That was a pretty good voice, but just in case you didn't hear. <laughs> um, so down, down here, in this certain triangle down here, all the scores are negative. That's a good point. But that's OK, because we are predicting with the highest score, and it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Yeah? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it could be, it's more like a rotation of the double Good call. All right. Let's think about that. I see what you mean. <laughs> Good point. So the point was that if for the, when, the ang when the score is negative, increasing the norm of w will make it more negative, which will make it less likely to be selected. But if it's positive, it'll make it more likely to be selected. It's a very good point. Think about that. Any more? Good points? Yes. Or questions? The question is, can I give an example of when there's a problem with the hypothesis space? Maybe we'll talk about that later. Yeah. OK. Yes. All right. So let's talk about how we can actually. More question? W transpose x, x dot w, yeah. Yes. No, no, it's when. There, it's negative when the angle between x and w is more than 90 degrees. So for instance, yeah, so this vector and this are more than 90 degrees apart, so it's negative. Right. Yeah. Cool. OK. So we're about to reframe things a little bit to prepare us for some more advanced methods. So right now, we have our base hypothesis space. I made it general now, no linearity. We'll bring linearity back in a minute. So we have a hypothesis space of h's. And our multi-class hypothesis space that's predicting an actual class is going to be the arg max of these individual score functions. We have k of them, k score functions. Okay. And to search for the right class, we evaluate h1 through hk, see which is the biggest. 
So I'm going to switch it a little bit to any framework that at least subsumes the other framework. Let's now assume we have a general output space Y. All right, so one example would be a discrete set of K classes, but let's just call it a general space Y. And our base hypothesis space now, instead of just mapping from X to R, it takes a Y to. All right, so this is, called, this is going to be giving us a way to think about this new thing instead of it being a score function for a particular class. Now, this h, we're going to think of as it giving a compatibility score between the provided x and the provided class y. All right? So we have, this is a new type of object. It takes an input x and an output y and predicts a score for the pair. So it's not that big a change, really. Before, we had a separate function for each possible y that gave the score. And now we have a single function that takes an x and a y. The difference is now we could have y be a much bigger space. Maybe we don't want to have 100 billion different functions. We just want to have one, and you could provide any y that's relevant to that function. OK. So now the final hypothesis space, rather than doing an arg max over your classes, we have the arg max over, well, rather than being over i from 1 to k, we have the arg max over an element of the output space. And then we evaluate the compatibility between x and y. And whichever has the highest compatibility, that's our winner. That's the y we predict. Is that clear? It's not a massive change, but it's a little, it's a subtle change. All right. And this is the framework we're going to use today. All right. So how do we do learning? So this is the question. How do we choose these base hypotheses or this hypothesis from this multi-class space? All right, so we have our base hypothesis space now taking x and y. We have some training data. And a learn so a learning process, I don't know if I've ever defined the learning algorithm. The learning algorithm is something that takes a training set and produces a prediction function, or maybe a training set and a hypothesis space and chooses the hypothesis from the hypothesis space. And fine, so we're going to have a learning process that chooses h from the hypothesis space. And the question is, what type of h do we want to how do we know we found a good H? That's my question for you. How do we know we found a good H? Given this is the way we do our prediction. Well, how about for a single trading point, x and y? Suppose we have x and y. How do we know if H is doing a good job on x, y, or not? All right. So given the function h, when will we actually predict y for x? Yeah, when the compatibility score between x and y is high, right? If we want to predict y given x, the compatibility score between x and y better be high. And in fact, it should be higher than the compatibility score between x and all the other y's. Because right? that's how we're going to finally choose what we predict. Whichever has the highest compatibility score, that's the class that we predict. All right, so we want h of xy to be large, and in fact, larger than h of xy prime for y prime not equal to y or something. All right, so here's in math. So h of xy classifies a particular training example xiy correctly if and only if h xi yi is bigger than h, x, i, y for all y not equal to y, i, right? OK. So this, from here, we can almost start to see what a good objective function would be. So an equivalent to this is simply h of x, i, y is bigger than the score of the correct combination of x, i, and y, i should be bigger than the score of all the, the biggest of the scores of all the other ones. It's just an equivalent way to write it. Not clear? All right. So if we want the thing on the left to be bigger than the thing on the right, and we want to make an objective function out of it, well, we can bring the thing on the right over to the thing on the left and take a difference. And then we want that to be bigger than 0. Um, maybe we could have a loss function that penalizes things when that difference is small. So we're thinking about an objective function that looks like this. 
inside the brackets, this is a thing we want to be big, right? Because h, x, y, i, we want that compatibility to be a lot bigger than the other one. So this thing should be big. We could put a loss function on that. So a loss function should penalize when, it's, when this difference is small and be small when this difference is big. Does this remind you of anything? Like some other problem we've dealt with, like classification? With margins. <laughs> yeah, hinge loss has this property. If you take hinge loss is small for when its argument's big, so when margin is big, and it's big when the argument's small and margin is negative. So you might imagine taking something like a hinge loss or some other margin loss, margin based loss, and applying it to this sort of object, and that seems like it'd be on the right track. Alright. Alright, we're gonna come back to we're going to come back to this it's a little more rigor later. OK. Well, so what do we have so far? We have, a, we have the idea of a base hypothesis space of compatibility functions. Um, and then we know how to take these compatibility functions and make a final prediction of, cl of a class. And what we're going to talk about now is a little bit more practical. How do we make these compatibility functions? How do we make these linear compatibility functions? Because we've never done this before. All of our functions have been score functions on just the input. So we make features of x. But now we have a function of x and y. So do we make features of x and y, or what's going on there? That's the question that we're posed with. All right. So we define a, a linear class-sensitive score function. So not just a score function. Now we're putting a class in there, too class-sensitive score function as h, x, y, inner product of some parameter vector w, and this new entity psi of x, y. Psi of x, y is our class-sensitive feature map. It's the analog of a feature vector, except packed into that feature vector is also information about a class y. So we have x, and we have y, and we somehow come up with a feature vector that we're then going to multiply by parameter vector w to come up with our score function for the compatibility between x and y. Is that confusing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, like, say, after we build a model and OK, so we, so we built a model. What does that mean? We built a model means, well, two pieces. We had to dis define this class-sensitive feature map. <laughs> And then we had to learn w. OK, so we've done that. And then we have a new data point, and we don't know the y. Great question. OK, so we've, we've determined, we've figured out w, and we've defined psi. All right, and we have a new x. How do we figure out what y to predict? You try every y and plug it in to hxy and see which has the highest compatibility score. And that's what you predict. If it's hard to try every y, like I just said, like maybe there's too many y's, we're going to need another trick. Um, that's where this notion of structured prediction comes in, which I think we'll mention at the end. Yeah. So what's interesting here is just the question is, what's the, I wrote this as an RD. So remember in our features lecture, we up until the features le lectures, we were saying, oh, x is an element of RD. Then during the features lecture, we said, you know what, let's let x be arbitrary, an arbitrary space x, and let's introduce a feature map that maps x to RD. Now what we're doing is we're letting the input space and the output space both be arbitrary. x and y are arbitrary spaces. And we're asking that the feature map map into RD. All right, so the question is, what should this class-sensitive feature map look like? What are some strategies? What are, what are, our, our, what are our options? All right. And this is the final multi-class hypothesis space, what we just described. Great. All right, so somehow, the feature vector has to represent 
some, has to be a representation somehow of how well y matches x. And more precisely, we're going to have to take this feature vector and through just a linear combination of the features of psi, we're going to have to come up with the score. So the feature vector doesn't have to do all the work to come up with how well y matches x, but it has to get close enough that all we need to do is take a linear combination of the elements of that feature vector to come up with a, a good compatibility score. This is just an issue of this being a linear method. All right. So this was, this was the classification that worked well for the three classes, right? So how can we code this up into our new framework? Because we, we coded this up into w1, w2, w3. So how do we put this into our, our score function that takes x and y? So let's, let's take, write down some actual, actual uh, vectors for w1, w2, and w3. Angles are a little off, but that's the right idea. And we had the, OK, so we've gone over this enough. So this was our final prediction function. And the question is, how do we map that? Is it something that looks like this? Instead of the argmax over 1, 2, 3 with three w's, we have a single w and this new type of feature vector. Any ideas? It's actually not so difficult. It's a little funny. So what if we stack all these w's together in one giant vector? All right. So that's what I've done here. I've taken w and I've put w1 first, and then I put w2, and then I put w3 in. So now w is in r246, r6. All right. All right, so that's w. And then what if we make our feature vectors like this? So did I, say again? Yeah, there should be three in the third line. Thanks. Maybe you can send me an email with that correction later. That'd be, that'd be helpful. All right. So we have to make this class-sensitive feature vector. So if we have, so x is in R2. x is in R2. It's rest represented by x1 and x2. All right. So what's going on here is when we plug in psi of x with class 1, we're going to put x1 and x2 in the first two positions. And we put psi of x2, we're going to put x1 and x2 in the second two positions. And psi of x3, that should be 3, we put it in the third position. So does this work? This is, is this nonsense or does this work? What happens if we take the inner product of w and psi x1? Well, the last four entries of psi x1 are 0. So the only thing that's relevant is Basically, w1 inner proc with x1, x2, which is exactly what we need, right? OK, et cetera. So this, this definition of psi, which is a mapping from x and y to r6, and this r6 parameter vector can reproduce the same thing that we had in the other setting. Um, so this strategy, where we take our x's and we kind of we increase our feature space. We basically, if our original feature space was of size, in this case, two, and we have three classes, we multiply three by two for our new space. We just replicate as many times as we have classes. All right. Great. Um, question, yeah. See this number here, 1, 2, 3? That's the psi of x comma space. This space is where the feature is where the class goes. See psi x, y? So this is the slot for the class. And how does that manifest itself? Depending on what class is here, we put the x1 and x2 in a different position. Yeah. More questions?
Okay. Is this equivalent to? I'm sorry. Say it one more time. All combinations of the features of x and y. And all the different categories of y. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you're suggesting um, maybe we could do like logistic regression or something? Yeah. Or linear regression. Um, and what would the response that we're trying to predict be? Zero or one, depending on? One or negative one. OK. So if I, I think what you're suggesting, correct me if I'm wrong, is what if we took our problem and we reformulated it as follows? Every xy pair gets recast as xy is the input, and the output is plus 1, because that xy actually happened, plus 1. And maybe you would make up some artificial examples of xy pairs where it's xy prime, and the label would be negative 1. And then you try to separate the ones that happened from the ones that didn't happen. And the yeah, and the features are this very obvious interaction between the original features and the classes. Um, so the feature space is certainly the interaction between the original features and the class. That's for sure. Now, whether it's equivalent, I haven't actually completely defined what we're, what our, we haven't defined the learning method yet, so I can't say it's equivalent or not. I'd say, based on the idea that we're making like negative examples in this setting, it may not be equivalent. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, maybe. I don't think so. I don't see that necessarily. No? Maybe it is. It's interesting. OK. It would still depend on what your final thing is, logistic regression or linear regression or, yes? One sec. Uh, you're s you said one for all? Yeah, actually, you have, uh, you have infinite solutions, right, for the hyperplane. Because every constant multiplied by the w is also your one solution, right? If you multiply w plus multiply by 3, 4, it's also your best solution, right? OK, so you're talking about finding this w. Yes. OK, go on. So you, you can multiply, for example, w1. By two, by three, by four, it's also your best solution, right? Yes. Because you have infinite type of infinite solutions. Yes. So imagine that you're running once your algorithm and your the length of W one is one is one and in another simulation it's two, it's one it it could change the W length and you can change change the score according to your simulation. Because if when you're running this SVN algorithm, you have no control about what the length of W1, 2, and 3. You're saying W1, 2, and 3. Oh, I see. So you mean you, your SVM solves for W, and you're saying you don't have any control on W1, 2, and W3 individually. OK, this is true. They're not going to all be 1 like they are here. But it could change. You know, the first time that you run, it, the length of W1 could be 10, and the another one could be 20. And it could be thirty. And how can you how can you compare? Because two the simulations could give different type of score. So you're saying that um, so the question or claim is that uh, we can run. I haven't even specified the method yet, but suppose eventually we have an optimization problem, and we're going to find w by minimizing some objective function as we usually do. 
And uh, what you're saying is that you're saying, be, OK, because, you said because the lengths of the individual w1, w2, and w3 vectors don't matter for the, OK, this is already not quite true, right? Because when we change the lengths of these, the regions change. Yeah, these are not, uh, well, that's the point, is that these are not going to be found based on separating hyperplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah, that's kind of how things, so this is kind of exactly what we talked about here. Well, back on the separating hyperplane slide. So uh, anyway, I think, uh, I think we agree. It's not, we're not going to be finding separating hyperplanes. Because that, yeah, doesn't work. All right, let's take a break, unless there's another question before. OK, break. All right. So input space, all possible words, output space, these six parts of speech. What kind of features would we make for x? You guys have done something like this before on homework, maybe. What features might you use for words if this is your goal? Maybe native speakers should have some ideas, at least. OK, I have an idea. Character what? Character engrams. Character engrams. All right, wow, nice. That's a, better than what I was going to say. Just put all character engrams in there. So of how long? Length one, two, three, four, five. Great, that's the, that's the right approach. I was going to say something really like heuristic, like how about word ends in L-Y, or word ends in N-E-S-S. -S. But your approach is better. OK. So features, you could have the word itself as a feature of x. How would you represent that? You could use, um, we were just talking about it. What are these things called? Dummy variable representation, where a particular dimension gets the value 1 if the word is hello, and it gets the value 0 otherwise. It's a, it gives you a high dimensional space, but this is standard in natural language processing. All right, so we have some, a few ends in. Features, we have the word itself. Is it that word feature? So those are features of x. And then, OK, we want to end up with features of x and y. So we'll use our multivector approach and just take the interactions between those. So we can write psi of x, y in terms of individual feature functions, psi 1 through psi d, each one determining the value of a particular feature. So here are a few examples. So psi 1, the first entry could be, the word is apple, and the class is noun. All right. Word is run, and class is noun. 
These are features depending on x and y. Word is run and class is verb. All right. So which of these, each of these gets a parameter, right? For every entry of the class dependent feature vector, we have an entry in the parameter vector. So what do you think the w1, the first entry of w, would be for psi1? Would it be large or small? This is, yeah. Yeah, OK. With, with lots of hand waving, we'll say that it's going to be large because it's correct. Maybe run and noun, run can be a noun, but maybe less frequently than verb. So maybe this number is smaller than this one. This is by no means precise because what happens is when you build a model, there might be other ways to derive the same information. And so just because this is correct doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get a positive weight because it might be giving positive weight somewhere else. It's a little bit hard to predict. But at least intuitively, we would think that the weight would be higher for the ones that are correct and smaller for the ones that are wrong. OK. All right. So I just want to make sure we're 100% clear. I think we're clear. But I just want to make sure we're 100% clear on how we would actually use this, this thing. So, so suppose we've done training, which we still haven't quite said how we're going to do. And we've learned that parameter vector w. Suppose it's like you know, we have actual numbers to the parameter vector. And someone gives us an input apple. x is equal to apple. And then how do we actually figure out the final prediction? We're going to compute these, these compatibility scores by taking the inner product between w and the class-specific feature vector. So we have psi of apple noun, psi of apple verb, psi of apple adverb. Each of those gives us a vector. We take the inner product of each of those with w. Those inner products give us scores. We see which score is the highest. That's the class we use. That's the method. OK? Just want, to be, just want to be sure. All right. So I'm going to talk about a different kind of feature. It's, um, I mean, one thing you notice here is that this feature space is the size of the feature space is the size of your original feature space for x times the number of classes you have. So if your classes size of, if the number of classes you have is very large, your feature space really blows up. Um, so now we're going to talk about a feature that doesn't blow up that way. We had it on one of the homeworks. It's an optional TF-IDF features. So here, a natural problem is we have a news article as an input. We want to figure out what class it is from a set of topics. All right. So our approach is going to be to look at the individual words. And certain words are going to be indicative of certain topics and not of others. Um, so for instance, maybe White House is indicative of the politics topic. and because it shows up mostly in politics and maybe not as much in the other ones. Whereas the word the, well, that shows up a lot in all these topics, so it's not very predictive. And how do we capture that? So TF-IDF is, is an approach. The TF stands for term frequency, which is nothing but the count of the number of times a word shows up in a particular document, x. So TF of wx is how many times the word shows up. And then we want to control the fact that certain words show up a lot everywhere. So we got to normalize this thing. So there's this thing called the document frequency, which is a function of the word and the class. Right? Everything can be a function of x and y. So here, this is a count of how many documents contain the word w that are not in class y. So this is, this is how do we figure this out? We have to look at our training set. To define the feature, we have to look at the training set which is kind of interesting, but it's fair. You can do anything you want with the training set. Um, is this clear? So when we're testing out the document frequency for wy, df for wy, we're going to look in the training set for all the documents not in y and see often how many of those documents contain the word w. All right. So the final feature is, some, is almost the ratio. It's the term frequency. So the more often the word appears in the document is a stronger vote for um, that word. And then we normalize it by how often, how many kind of other documents it's contained in that aren't the class to kind of downweight the, the impact of that word. All right. So this is used a lot for these types of text classification problems. And 
this is just this is actually an, I've never actually seen this particular TF idea. This is what the textbook have I had. It's it's usually there's lots of different variations of it though. You can go to Wikipedia. It gives you like 25 different TF IDF variations, um, different normalizations and stuff. But this captures the idea. So so here's a question to see if we're getting it. Suppose we have D words in our vocabulary and we have K classes and we have a TF-IDF feature for each word, what's the dimension of psi? So how many TF-IDF features do we have? What's the dimension of the vector? Yeah, so we want to say d times k, but actually here's the definition of TF-IDF for a single word and you'll see that um, it's just, a, it's just a number. We don't have to have a separate dimension for every class. We plug the class y into this function and we get a number and this number changes depending on which class we're using. So a particular entry of the feature vector will change as we try out different classes. So it's kind of this entry measures the compatibility between a particular word and each of the classes. And the class that's representing the compatibility, compatibility with changes as you feed in different y's into the feature function. No. So I try to make an analogy here with the other type. So let's go back to our NLP style feature function. So here, for every, for every class and every word, we have a different dimension that's either 1 or 0. Um, all right, so run and the, the indicator for x being run and y being noun and x being run and y being verb, we plugged, we plugged in different y's, true, but the feature vector here was, um, it was turning on 0 and 1 in different entries, in different coordinates. So the analog, if, if we made it kind of TF-IDF style, we would have, that's a bug. No, that's okay. So we have this, we would have a feature function called like x is run. And then we would say when we plug in different y's, we would have there would be a score, a number that changes, depending on how compatible run is with the class y. So this would be the closest analog of what TFIDF is doing to this type of feature. The information of y is on the IDF part of the TF IDF. IDF depends on y. Yeah, IDF depends on the on the class part. That's right. So yeah, the the class the y part only enters into the feature in the normalization in the in the DF, the document frequency frequency part. All right. Yes. So the arguments are x and y, a particular y and a particular x. This subscript thing? Yeah, sorry. So it's I this is confusing. Apologies. So I am creating a particular feature function and I'm naming it the the name of that function is x equals run. So the, the word is run. And then that's indicating, like, I'm going to have a single dimension in my feature vector that corresponds to x equals run. And this will, it'll be a, a numeric score, and that'll be what it is. All right. OK. So here's another approach, which is more intuitive. Um, so suppose we have a huge number of classes. Um, so like advertising. Input is a user, maybe the context the user is in. And then we're going to show them a lot of ads, and we want to see what they click on. Okay? So maybe there's a huge space of ads. 
And we don't even have time to learn a lot about every ad because we get new ads all the time, old ads disappear. So rather than having to learn like parameters for every, separately for every ad, another approach is to featureize or make a featureized representation of an ad. So rather than just referring to an ad as like, you know, ads number seven or ad number 28, which is kind of what we are doing for kind of the same way we're treating parts of speech. It's just unrelated entities that we know nothing about except its particular class number or class name. Here we're saying we can actually um, represent, describe the label itself in a certain way. So um, for example, so the input for feature one would be OK, the user x and the, the ad y, so the, the ad number or something. And the feature could be a 1 if user is interested in sports from some metadata we have about the user, and the ad y is relevant to sports. Right? So this feature, we can learn about its importance from lots of ads. Any ads that are relevant to sports would potentially fire this feature. And any users that are interested in sports would be in this feature. So this is where we're able to leverage characteristics of the label itself in the feature vector representation. Okay. Any questions about this? If anybody asks you how to do ad targeting, this this might be a good way to think about it. Like you have some information about an ad, and you have some information about a person, and you want to see if they're compatible, it helps to characterize the ad as well as the person. OK, if your categories are not ex uh, So in this, so our, our categories are mutually exclusive right now. If, yeah. So the question is, what about non-mutually exclusive categories? That's, usually you can reframe that into mutually exclusive categories, like sets of categories. And then your Y is a set of sets or something. And then the only question is, how do you score how good one set is at approximating another set? And this is how you get to things like multi-label. You can see multi-label, which I, maybe you're getting at, as a, as a complicated instance of multi-class, except the, the labels themselves are sets of things. Okay. All right. OK, you guys ready for the multi-class SVM? All right. So first we can, uh, so SVM has this notion of margin. And we can generalize this idea of margin to the multi-class framework. So we're going to think about the margin between the correct class and every other class. right? So now, because we have lots of classes. So we'll say the margin of a prediction function h when predicting y on the ith example xi, yi. OK, so the, we're inputted xi. We want to predict yi. yi is the correct thing. That's the, that's the right thing. And then we're going to look at what's the margin between the score of the correct thing, yi, and the score of y, which may be incorrect. Right? This h, xi, y, we want that to be the biggest score. And this xi, y, we want that to be smaller whenever y is not equal to yi. So the difference, that's what we're going to call the margin. And so we don't just have a margin on a particular example. We have a margin between, for an example and an alternative, y. So you have y in the subscript. So m sub i, i is the example number to tell us which x, i, y pair to use. y is the thing that we're comparing it to to see what the margin is. And h is our prediction function. Should we sum over the y's? Yeah. OK. We could take a sum over the y's, and then you're saying penalize that. Is this a suggestion? No, I mean, this is all open field. We can make up our own objective function. Yeah, we can invent something. So one proposal is, let's penalize the sum of those differences. Uh, that's been proposed. There's a paper on that. What would another possibility be? 
Yeah, so let's, let's worry about um, the worst case difference. What's the worst case difference? The smallest difference is the bad one. Well, for y not equal to yi, right? So y equal yi, it's 0. Let's look at the next worst one, the next one that's closest. And let's try to make that as big as possible. One margin to be big. So you could use max, you could use sum would be another possibility. All right, so we want this margin to be large and positive for all y not equal to yi. All right, so in terms of our linear spaces, we can just rewrite the h's in terms of the inner products, our usual thing. All right, so let's remember the binary SVM for inspiration. We have w and rd. We have our L2 regularization term. We have this average of this hinge loss on the margin. This is the, the binary. Well, this is the margin, then we have the hinge loss on the margin. right? Remember this plus I introduced that momentarily. This is basically takes the positive part. All right. So let's try to make an analog for a multi-class in the obvious way. So multi-class SVM, version 1, looks really similar. We have this margin notion. And then now we have a margin for every alternative y. So let's take the worst case hinge loss over all alternatives y. OK. And that's our average loss. And then we compare that to, uh, we regularize that. And that would be SVM version 1. Multi-class SVM. Stare at it some more. All right. So let's move on. Well, you'll get to think about this again because we have a slightly different version now. So now, one another difference from binary classification is for binary classification, it seemed like the obvious ultimate goal was 0, 1 loss, right? You either get it right or you get it wrong, and that's how you'd want to score on your test set. But when you have multiple classes, it's not obvious that that's the case. Maybe certain errors are worse than others. Right? Maybe if you, um, yeah, you could just imagine certain classes have a larger penalty for confusing than other ones. And so we can introduce this delta. So delta takes uh, the actual label and your predicted label A, your action space. And it maps it to a, a loss, which is your target loss. So this could be 0, 1, or it could be something more general. And then we can take this kind of target loss that we want to minimize and make that like our target margin. So here, remember in the hinge, binary hinge loss, we're trying to get our margin to be at least 1. Because greater than 1, there's no penalty. Remember that? All right. So we carry the same thing over to multi-class. But now we, can, we have a method to the madness of adjusting the target margin for each class pair. So we can look at, we can put, instead of a 1, we can put this target loss or target margin, delta y, i, y. And this is a more standard form of the multi-class SVM. People want to make it a little bit more general. Yeah. Yeah, so what's the use case of this? I'll give a, a weak use case first, and then I'll tell you a more important use case. So first is just you have six classes, and two of them are like really similar and hard to distinguish. And even if you mix them up, it's not that big a deal. OK, make delta small. And then there's another class that's really different, and it's a terrible mistake. You don't want that to happen. Make delta large. That's use case one. I don't know, in most practical situations, I don't see that happening very often, that people actually have strong opinions that make them want to tune delta for that simple k-class classification. But what we're going to maybe get to later is structure prediction, where now your output space is huge, exponentially large. An example would be, take the part of speech tagging problem, but let's do part of speech for an entire sentence at once. So if your sentence is, um, 
10 words long. And we have 40 parts of speech, which is actually more typical in part of speech problems. Then what's the size of our output, of our output space? 40 to the 10th power. Huh? Because in every, for every word, we need to pick a part of speech out of 40 parts of speech. And then we have, if the sentence is, how long was it? If the sentence is 10 words long, then we have 10 different parts of speech to string together. So the possible set of outputs that we're producing are 40 to the 10th power, which is really big. OK. Now, I would claim that in that case, it's much more obvious. There's much more, there are much more obviously good errors versus bad errors. So for example, suppose, here, suppose you have your true part of speech labeling a sequence of 10 parts of speech. And then you have the one you predicted, which is exactly the same, except in one position. I would claim that loss is much smaller than if you were wrong in every position. OK. So that's a much more obvious situation where you want delta to adjust based on what you predicted and what's actually true. Do you buy that? Do that convince anybody? Now I think it's I think that's we'll talk about it after unless you have another question to follow up. Okay. So Say again. Yeah, yeah so we're look basically for every y that we might confuse with yi. We, there's a certain badness to it. And we want to make sure that the margin is respecting that amount of badness. Yeah. OK. So let's do a little bit of a geometric discussion. Um, so prediction. Once again, we're predicting which has the largest inner product between w and our class sensitive feature vector. Great. And this inner product, the prediction is not changed if we normalize w, right? Because all of the inner products are scaled by the same amount. If we replace w by w over norm w, fine. So let's assume w is norm 1. And the reason I like that is because then this inner product is just a projection, right? So the norm of w is 1, so that falls out. And we get psi xy, length of psi xy cosine theta. So that's the projection of psi xy on w. I drew a picture for you. So here's w, length 1. Here's psi xy. Let's start this thing about this for a second. So psi xy basically takes an input and an output and embeds it in the same space as w. Right? So this is r2. So psi xy has embedded it in r2. And then psi xy cosine theta, that's the length of this thing here. So I've written an S. All right. So the score, if W is norm 1, which is reasonable to assume, is the, projection, the length of the projection of psi xy onto W. All right. So then look, let's look at this. So here I've, now I took this from the book. That's why it's very professional looking. <laughs> so here we have three classes, y, y prime, and y double prime. And we evaluate psi x y for each of them. And we end up at three different points in our feature space. Right? So it's three different call them embedding points. And now we have our w vector. And then the scores are, the, are kind of how far away we are from the origin on, in the direction of the w vector, so the projection. And what they've drawn here is, so psi xy, that's the correct so y is the correct prediction. And then here is y prime, which is the, the first incorrect predi prediction. And we want the gap between these things to be at least delta y, y prime. So delta y, y prime is kind of the, our target margin, our target loss. And y pr double prime, it should be bigger. Um, so I don't know, intuitively what I think about is that you have this direction vector w. And when you project all of your 
embeddings of the x's and y's onto w, there's a natural ranking to the y's, right? The one that's further out on w in the positive direction, that's the one you're going to predict. You're going to predict, question? No. You're going to predict the one that's, here's the origin, I guess. You're going to predict the one that's furthest this way along w. So we'll predict y. It's good. And then there's a ranking, kind of a hierarchy, to the other y's. And we want to make sure that that ordering is correct. And that the spacing is respective of the class sensitive loss functions we have. Questions? Yeah? Okay, hold on. So normalizing the features, I mean, the features. So make, so make the feature vectors so that they are nicely contained. You don't want it to be a factor? I, you can design psi xy however you want, but once you design it, you, you, don't, you do not normalize the outputs. Like You can build normalization into the definition of psi, but then you fix psi, and then you learn w, and then you do not normalize psi after that. That's clear. OK. Same thing when we're doing any kind of linear regression or logistic regression. If you want to normalize your features, you can, but you do that before you train your model. And you use it, do the normalization based just on training data. OK. All right, any questions? I think we have enough time to do an introduction to structured prediction, which I think is pretty cool. Yes? So everything we've seen so far, you see it's the soft it's, in, it's not inspired by it, it's in spite of it. <laughs> it's instead of it. But like we, we're trying to compare one class versus all, all the others. We're trying to figure out which of many classes is the correct class. Because uh, why do we try to use the all versus all approach? Would it, uh, would it be better than the all versus all? Or, or Yeah, OK. So the question is basically, I motivated the talk by saying that I set up a straw man argument that this one versus all fails, so let's find something better. What you're suggesting is that there are other ways to reduce multi-class classification to binary classification. I only gave one example. Another example is called all versus all, where you take all pairs of, um, all pairs of classes and you make a classifier to distinguish between any pair of classes. And then you vote or do something like that to combine the results um, into a single prediction. Uh, another fancier way is um, you encode the classes with something called an error correcting code. And you predict each bit of the error correcting code representing the class uh, using a different binary classifier. And that's cool and works well sometimes. But um, yeah, all those are reductions. And I don't know that any is. I'm not sure if they've found if there is a reduction that's as good as multi-class. I'm not sure about that. It's a good question. But certainly the one we showed isn't. And all pairs isn't either. OK. Good question. Does anyone know the answer? OK. All right. So I'll start with an example, which I said verbally. This is, the, this is the actual part of speech tagging problem that you'll find in a, you know, lecture two of an NLP class, which I suggest you might want to take some time. It's interesting stuff. So the input is a sentence. We can have a special token start for the beginning of the sentence. He eats apples. The input is x. will denote the individual words 
by x, x1 to x3. And we want to, the output we want to give is, is, a, is also a sequence of labels this time. And this is the sequence of parts of speech. So the output is y, and it too has, we can treat it as a sequence, y0 through y3. Okay. Okay. And what you should note is that the output space is huge. It's the number of parts of speech to the nth power, where n is the length of the sentence. So I've only given a few parts of speech. The classic part of speech problem is something like 40 parts of speech, because they break things up into subcategories, which are mutually exclusive. OK. So what's a structure prediction problem? A structure prediction problem, loosely speaking, is a multi-class problem where the output space is huge. And we also assume it has some structure. So it's this structure that saves us from having to do an evaluation of the score function for 40 to the 10th power different classes. We can get around that using dynamic programming. So it's the dynamic programming part that we won't have time to talk about today. But there's more to it than just that. There's the structure in our speech tag problem is basically that we believe most of the information we need to use about from the input to predict a part of speech is either near the particular label we're predicting, is basically near the particular label we're predicting. So if we're trying to find a part of speech for a word at the end of the sentence, we can most likely ignore what's going on five words back. Right? It gives us some information, but a structured assumption that we can make is that there can be mechanical errors. That's what makes this thing happen. So here's some, here's, here's how we um, build the structure into the hypothesis space to make everything simple. We build what are called local feature error assumptions. That's actually just my term, but it seems like a good one. Um, maybe other people use it, I'm not sure. And then the book calls the type about to describe type one. Type 1 is a local feature function. So a type 1 local feature, it only depends, so remember these things are now features of x and y, right? We've moved on to um, class sensitive feature functions. So type 1 depends on a label at a single position. So let's say yi, the ith label of the sentence. And what's free to depend on x at any position? That's the answer. So again, phi i. Depends on, we give it the position the sentence we want to look at, the ice word, we give it the entire input sentence, and then a particular label of yi that we're considering. And we're going to say, how does yi fit? What's the feature compatibility here? And we'll say, this feature function will be a one if the word is key and the label is pronoun. Whatever you're going to say. And notice it's only looking at the ice word and the ice label. Right, we could look at any words in the input we want, so xi minus 1 is p, xi is e, and then the label is prose, that's fine. This is our type 1. And then type 2 is where we look at two adjacent labels. So for instance, we'll give this piece of theta 1, it'll be 1 if the previous label is pronoun and the current label is verb. Um, and here's one where the previous label is verb and the current is verb. So what do you, do you think the, uh, I would say the parameter for this verb verb Combo would be small. It's very unusual to have two verbs in a row. Okay. So it's these type two features that are encoding kind of dependence between adjacent labels. Right? The fact that the fact that verbs don't very rarely occur right next to each other is a signal that if if there's some word that seems like um, like for instance, if I have a computer program and you get caught like you know, a run of the program, and then I can say, oh, the run runs, right? So that actually is, that's not a verb verb, even though if you just looked at the words, run and runs, they both, they seem like both verbs, but when I say the run runs, I know that, okay, actually the first one is a noun, the second is a verb, and this fact that these like, two consecutive verbs would probably have a parameter value that's like negative, voting against this ever happening, is what lets me 
deduce that the run run is not for a verb. We can finally local features sum of type 1, sum of type 2. Let's pack them all into one long local feature vector, psi i, the feature vector of asking location i and anything. It does look at, it can look at any x's that it wants, but it only looks at yi minus 1 and yi. That's a local feature vector. And so our local compatibility score is going to be, what we're claiming, really defining, is the inner product of the standard vector. Kind of locally, how compatible do x and y look? So, let me rephrase. Given an x and a y, we want to figure out how compatible the label sequence y is with the input sequence x. And then what this is saying is, well, I don't know about overall, but if I just look at the position of y, in that region, x and y look compatible or not compatible. That's what the local compatibility score is giving us. Right? And then how do we get an overall compatibility score? So the whole sequence. Well, we add them up. So, compatibility score for the pair sequence is the sum of the local compatibility score and the sum of the inner product. What can be the sum of the inner product? This isn't the sum inside the inner product, that's the reality. And now we have the sum of these local feature vectors. All these feature vectors are in RD, we're summing them, you get a vector in RD, you get a, another element of the feature vector. <coughs> And we should call that psi. And that's the feature vector for the entire sequence. The feature vector for the entire sequence is the sum of the local feature vectors. And that depends on x and y. So now we are exactly in the multi class scenario. There's nothing local left. We have psi xy, which is our computerized representation of our pair input and output. And then we're going to have a parameter w. And we can theoretically now treat this as a regular multi class problem. The issue is, um, so the issue is, given a given an x, to find the y we want to predict, we have to do this hard match over all possible sequences, which we can't do. It's too many in a brute force way. But there's kind of if you ever do an interview with like Google or Facebook. Invariably, the more interesting problems are these dynamic programming propositions. And if you ever prepare for such an algorithm test, the way to solve this maximization is very, very straightforward dynamic programming. So if you have a computer science background, it's, it's, it's actually fairly easy. It seems like the Kirby algorithm um, are instances of very simple instances of dynamic programming. All right. So now we talk about these target sequence plots. So you're saying, why do we want delta to be different for different pairs of labels? And I'm saying, oh, it's a really good example of the true sequence. That's what's going on here. We have, if y is the true sequence and y prime is something else, we're predicting how bad is y prime. One easy way to assess is how many position errors, how many positions do we have errors in? So we look at the sequence of like 10. We look at each of these 10 labels and say how many of them are wrong. And that would be the that would be the loss of that prediction. And we can set that up as the target, as the target margin in a multi class way. To generalize that a bit, we have actual you know, different penalties for different local errors. Said the hard part is figuring out this hard match and why it's very large. And so the key thing in our setup that allows us to solve this is that psi breaks down into these sum of local things that only depend on um, you know, consecutive pairs of labels. And that's what allows us to use this kind of dynamic programming. How many people in here have done dynamic programming? Very nice. Maybe more than So a place we'll really learn this is if you take um, inference and representation in engineering when we were doing this. Um, maybe we'll 
You guys can leave, but I'm thinking that we got four minutes. Getting everyone their money's worth. <laughs> Questions is allowing access to all X to load something up inside. So what are you worried about blowing up inside? Size and size. Oh, okay. Size. Oh yeah. So we could have access to exponentially different subsets of X, yeah. but we don't have to use them all. And in fact, typically we use only a small window of X around the size. Define psi i. No, not at all. Psi i's are future functions defined by hand or semi automatically. Another question? Okay. Five more seconds to ask the question. 